uh, go to Revelation 12, 5. Revelation 12, 5. Correct. Certainly. Let me know when you're there. I'm there. Okay. Could you read that? It says, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Okay. My question for you is this. The one who, the one who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, who is that in reference to? That is in reference to Jesus Christ. Okay. And who gave birth to the one that would rule all nations with a rod of iron? Well, as I just said moments ago, uh, but I'm happy to repeat, the, uh, there is, there's two answers to that question. One answer to that question is that Mary, which is the answer that, which I assume you're looking for, but also uh, you, would, you can also say uh, that the Jews in general, or David, or, um, and so forth, that these are those from whom Jesus came according to the flesh. So there's a, there's a narrow sense in which the specific woman was obviously Mary, and there's a broader sense in which he was a Jew, and so it's the, the nation of Israel. Okay. Um, in particular, in this verse, are we told that, are we given a gender of what gave birth to the male child? In the Greek, is there a gender here where it says she gave birth to a male child? Yes. Okay. And is that gender feminine? Yes, yes, because it's, uh, remember the symbol of who's giving birth here is the woman. So naturally, right. it's, part of the, it's part of the symbolism. Naturally, this woman is referred to as she and her and so forth. So. And would that not connect with Mary better than perhaps um, any other type of analogy? No, I don't think it fits better, with, better within the overall context of Revelation for a number of reasons. But one reason is that it doesn't fit as well with making a parallel to the other woman, the, the, the woman of Babylon, who's unfaithful and who's okay. uh, punished. Yeah, I, the, That also doesn't refer to a single wo- woman. It rather refers to more than one person. And it makes more sense to treat this woman similarly since it's in the same book and it's uh, a book full of symbolism. Okay. Church and Fan, um, earlier you had brought up uh, in particular, uh, I believe, the pangs of birth. Were you suggesting that that would eliminate Mary as being the one uh, that is being referenced in Revelation 12? Actually, uh, yeah, that that's, that was my point. How, okay, ter- great, Tristan. Um, how would that eliminate Mary? How would the term used for parents of birth eliminate Mary being the reference in this verse in Catholic theology? Well, in Catholic theology, there's a doctrine... Can I just finish off the sentence? Or? Yeah, I, yeah. Just, I, I can pull that for the next time. No problem. All righty. So then um, we have Turton Fan, and he is going to cross-examine William. Wonderful. Um, with respect to the question of the uh, writing the history of Joseph the Carpenter. Excuse me. <clears throat> the uh, the authorship of this uh, text and its acceptance in the church. Uh, can, would, would you like to comment on that? What, would would I like to comment? On what specifically? I'm, I'm kind of confused. What were you referring to? Uh, who, the wrote, of- who wrote the Who wrote the book? And is yeah, that I, I don't think the, Christian, like in the sense of having Orthodox. Christian belief. Yeah, I don't think we're exactly certain in who wrote it. I won't lie. I have not studied it in depth. I don't have an opinion either which way. I do know that as far as interpretations of Revelation 12, 
I do know that this was pointed out as being the earliest Mariological interpretation. We can also find in the early church that it is actually, in passing, referenced as bringing up this um, connection. We aren't told whether it was brought up in an orthodox fashion or not, because it is only brought up in passing. In passing, and I believe that was brought up by Ephraim. But as far as the authorship goes, I, I'm sorry, I really, I really don't know even which way he, who could have written this or who it was attributed to. Okay. Uh, does Does Revelation 12 uh, describe this woman as a queen? Excuse me. Does Revelation 12 call her a queen? Does Does Revelation 12 call the woman uh, clothed with the sun and moon under her feet and on her head a crown of twelve stars? Does it call her a queen? No, it does not use a specific term for queen. Does she have these? Uh, does she in Revelation 12? Where is she when? Uh, where does she appear in Revelation 12:1? And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. I believe that, I believe the imagery, the symbolism could be taken from the symbolic crown, which uh, in, in Greek is Stephana. And if we examine and we look up, um, uh, I believe that we can find its reference in, Matthew, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, John, and uh, each usage of this term. At times, it is in reference to something, uh, a symbolic crown or like a symbolic uh, adornment of something that is, uh, uh, of, you know, something uh, honorific. So I believe that it was, um, you know, I can see where the symbolism was taken from Revelation 12.1 to connect Mary with being the queen of heaven because we've got a woman clothed with the sun in heaven and, uh, I think they're okay. fully in tune with symbolic uh, theology. Yeah. And, and verse 2 says, uh, and verse 2 continues that. Uh, it says, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pains to be delivered. Uh, does there, is there anything in this uh, verse 2 that, uh, that, connects the, that connects with verse 1, or is it two, are we talking about two different things? No, you're talking about the exact same one, what we've got to be clear about here, as I was bringing up earlier, is the Greek word odenom. We can see it is used here for travail. It's used in a number of passages in the Bible. And we can see that it is not, and we must be clear, it is not necessarily referring to actual physical pain that a woman is going through. There are other pains that a woman endures rather than actual physical pain. And I believe this very Greek term used by the author was used for that purpose to show us that very fact. Hmm. So the um, then uh, the, there's a uh, there's in, during this time period uh, there's another great wonder that appears in heaven. Verse three, it says, "Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head," and. Uh, is that, uh, are you taking that to mean a literal dragon, or? A yeah, literal dragon, not at all. We can find a lot of symbolism here, because we, we see another sign appear. And, um, of course, it's, as you're well aware of, seven is, it, um, you know, it's perfection, whether it's perfect, uh, you know, something perfect, perfect in a positive or a negative connotation. I don't think, could be wrong here, though, but I do not think that this is in reference to a literal dragon. And, and in verse 4, it says, His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And given what I'm sure you know about a- astronomy, I suppose you don't take that literally meaning that, that you know, giant stars are going to be crashed, or cra- at some point crashed into the earth. No, and I don't think the early fathers that interpreted the earliest and interpreted as being a neurological mariolo- uh, reference passage, I don't think they believed or took it in a completely literal fashion either. And, but nevertheless, this is, this, these events that are taking place are it's still talking about the same general time. Is it says Correct. the dragon stood before the woman, which is ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born, right? So it's talking about the general, somebody is trying to eat Jesus. 
Absolutely, yes. We've got a lot of symbolism here. Right. Yes, it, it, I, I do definitely believe that the, that the woman can be interpreted as Mary. Um, the dragon, of course, uh, many have interpreted it as being Satan. And, of course, uh, the one that will, ru- will rule the rod of iron. It's, um, I don't really think there can be any doubt there that that is in reference to Jesus Christ. I hear a timer going off, so I think we're time, uh, time's up. Yeah, no. yeah your time just went off just now. <laughs> oh, okay. I wasn't aware of that. I was not aware of that. Okay, so, um, William, you can cross the exam, Turton fan now, and then Turton fan will have his last cross exam. Okay, I, um, I'm going to cross exam him. Am I correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay, great. These are the last two. You're, you're next, and then he's next after you. Okay, so we're, we're down to our last uh, last set of cross examination. Am I correct? Right. Yeah. This is your last your yeah. last cross exam. And then he'll have his last. Great. Okay. Let me go ahead and begin then. Okay, Tursen fan. I um just in a quick note, of course. Uh, you know, I'm not going to cross and on you on it, but if you are interested in bringing up uh, Jerome and Origin again, I was able to pull up those references for you in reference to uh, using the terms that I was referring to. But uh, let me go right back um, to Revelation 12. As we are, as we're well aware, I think you agree with me that there is a lot of symbolism in this verse. I'm going to narrow down my question real simple, and um, I would like you to get your opinion on it. Are you able to see in any kind of symbolism in this verse Mary at all, or would you completely rule Mary as being anywhere to be found in this verse? Just to be completely clear, I'm, what I'm saying is what the, the actual intended meaning by John the Revelator was, was not Mary. But I do see that the woman who gives birth to Jesus is easily, at first, interpreted as Mary when someone hasn't completely thought through the, the issue entirely. Or, to put it the way I can in uh, Ecumenius put it in this in a kind of in a primary sense that the first thing that pops in someone's head when they hear that a woman gave birth to Jesus, that the first person they would think of immediately is the Virgin Mary. Okay. Kirsten Fan, um did Mary give birth to the humanity and the divinity of Christ? Mary gave birth to the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, Correct. At, according okay. to flesh, as to his humanity. Yeah. Excuse me, you, you do agree? I'm sorry, what did you, uh, maybe I, I overspoke something you said. Yeah, I apologize. I was not trying to separate Christ and say that Mary perhaps gave birth to a nature only. No, my, my question was this. When Mary gave birth to Christ, did she give birth to, aside from, aside from his humanity, did she give birth to his divinity as well? Yes, in the same sense in which we say that that God died on the cross, or that Pilate put God to death, or something like that. Yeah, in those in that same sense, yes. But I think it's all, it should be clear how that can be confusing if it's not also explained. It's true, yes, but it can be confusing. Correct, but the Orthodox teaching is not confusing. Am I correct? The, the Orthodox teaching and explanation necessarily isn't confusing, but but the the title can be confusing because it's easily misunderstood. Okay. Church and Fan, what was the earliest reference to Revelation 12 in connection with Mary that you're aware of? That I'm aware of is the same uh, commentary that we've brought up a number of times now, the Ecumenius uh, one. But I could be mistaken. I, if uh, there may be some earlier that, that I'm unaware of, some, sometimes people reference things in passing. I may have overlooked something. Right. Um, are you aware of Hippolytus describing Mary as the woman of Revelation 12? I'm not. I can't. Or I, 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 no. Okay. I will move on to another question, and I want to admit I took this directly. Um, from, from what you were bringing up earlier. But um, 
would you agree with what St. Jerome says in regards to Mary when he says, when he gives her the term domina, which would mean sovereign, or which would also be translated into a sort of queen-type figure? I'm sorry. I, you, there's, I, I, there was a part of that at the beginning of it, I think I must not have followed, because you, you started with sovereign and you moved to queen-like figure. Correct, yes. The term that Jerome uses is translated as a sort of queen-like figure. Would you agree with that terminology that he applies to Mary? Could, could, you, just, could you tell me where, where you're quoting from Jerome so I have some context to look at yes, it? it is, uh, you can find it in the uh, Patrologia Latin, and uh-huh. it's in volume 23, page 42. I don't know how fast you could pull that up. Well, do you do you have the name of the work or? Um, it is called, I believe it is called, you know, it's in Latin, you know. Uh, it is a book on the, on, I believe on Hebrew names. You know, I, I'm, I cannot read Latin fluently, so I really don't know exactly what it's called. Okay. Well, I do know that it is volume 23. Though, name. Though, I'm, I'm familiar with that uh, book, so I, that's, that's good. So uh, I'm in volume 23 of PL, so, and you said uh, it's at, at column 82, uh, 842? That is 842, correct. St. Jerome is noting that Mary in Syriac is translated as domina, and he then goes on to tell us that it means lady, sovereign, which is indicating her dignity. But if you're unable to pull that up uh, relatively fast, I, I can move on to another question. Uh, no, I mean I have okay. I have that. I have uh, I have that. Ha- I have that in front of me now. The is, uh, the book of Hebrew Hebrew names. Uh, okay, in, the, in in particular, in Jerome's mentioning this in reference to Mary, would you disagree with what Jerome says about Mary here in this title? Uh, I think you could just say yes or no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry, I know my time stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I'm hesitant to agree without without a, a more careful reading of of what what term what term basically what term in Syriac is referring to. Not a problem. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, Turretin fans. So this will be your last cross exam, and then we will have closing statements. And um, William will have the first closing statement, and then you'll have the last one. So you can cross-examine William now. Okay. Uh, does uh, does the, do uh, do the scriptures teach us to speak of any other redeemer besides uh, the Lord Jesus Christ? Excuse me. What was that question again? Is there any other redeemer besides Jesus Christ? No, yes, but to put it differently, is Mary another redeemer? No, not at all. No, it's impossible. That is not even a, a Catholic teaching, not at all. You, in your opening statement, you said that she had a share in the, in the redemption. What do you mean by Correct. that? Now? Well, she... uh, again, we must be clear in what in the terms redeemer, redemption, and the term that is frequently used for Mary, which would be Redemptrix, it, it, it differs strongly in terms, in comparison with that of Redeemer. It, all it means is that Mary, basically, it's the exact same thing as the teaching of the Theotokos means. It means Mary gave birth to Christ and played a role, as Irenaeus says, in salvation history. Excuse me. It does not mean that Mary is a co-redeemer. It being a masculine term would be impossible the feminine term in particular is one of subordination, which simply means that Mary played a role in bringing forth the God-man in, doing her, in fulfilling her duty. It doesn't mean anything elevated in the sense that Mary was a redeemer or Mary, um, you know, anything elevating her above what the title itself means. All right. And 
do, do the scriptures tell us anywhere that Mary is involved in any maternal intercession? Absolutely. That's where? a very, very good point. Yes, absolutely. Where, uh, uh, where Mary asks uh, Christ to, well, when he, his first public miracle, turning water into wine, when, where she approaches him and tells him that they are all out of wine and he produces his first public miracle. Absolutely, that is an example of maternal intercession. It, whether whether it is in, in this life or the other, you didn't specify, but yes, that is a, a primary example of that. Does the scripture teach us that she continues to, to do that? That she continues to what? To intercede for us? To intercede for anyone. Well, that's a whole other issue. But yes, I do believe the scripture shows us that those that are in heaven, that are closer to God, are more alive than ever. And yes, that they can intercede for us and they can communicate our petitions to God for us. I think that's fairly evident in the scripture, but yeah, that, that would be a whole other debate, I believe. I'm mentioning it because you brought it up in your opening speech, speaking of her. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I was wondering if you could please tell us where scripture teaches us that Mary currently intercedes for anyone. Well, again, going right back to the whole point, um, the scripture doesn't even record the death of Mary. So we don't have that explicit teaching within scripture. We do have the explicit teaching, though, that those that die in Christ are more alive than ever, closer to Christ than any of us here. They're continually connected to the body of Christ. And yes, our petitions are of value. Uh, we are told that we're surrounded by them. We are told that they are given a number of duties in heaven. I think the teaching is evidently clear in the scripture that those that are with God in heaven are able to continually intercede for us. I don't think it specifically mentions Mary because we don't even have her death recorded in the scripture. So, uh, 